You know what? What a loving family. Um, I feel so loved, and that is awesome. Um, you guys are truly family, and it's great to be able to greet one another and to um, meet new people even. I met a new, few new people over here, and so it's exciting to be here uh, together this morning to learn from the Word of God, and we've got a lot to learn. If you look at us, we have a lot of growing to do as, as God's people, um, myself included. Thinking about Memorial Day and this whole reason that we have Monday off of work, you know, that's a, a lot of people are like, wow, I think Memorial Day was created for barbecues. Um, but it's much more profound than that. A year ago, my son Michael wrote an essay for an essay competition. And uh, in it, he talked about the reality that freedom is not free. Freedom costs somebody everything. And that is why we celebrate Memorial Day, to remember what people have done. They've given their life so that we might have freedom. And as my son was beginning to write this essay, I'm like, wow, that sounds like Jesus. He gave his life that we might have freedom. So anytime I think of someone that has given their life so that I might have freedom, that's modeling Christ. And many people in the military don't know Christ, but they're modeling who Christ is by living that out. What would it look like if us as a church, as Lakeside, lived in such a way where we were willing to give our lives so that others may have freedom? And not only freedom, um, not only receiving Christ, but having great joy, unstoppable joy in Christ. Because Paul, as we're going to see, as he, get, as he gets into the beginning of the book, book of Philippians, he doesn't want people just to have Christ. He wants people to enjoy Christ. There's a big difference. Now listen to this. Uh, D.L. Moody, about 100 years ago, uh, wrote this. He said, I think there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is caused by things which happen around me, and circumstances will mar it. But joy flows right through trouble. Joy flows right through the dark. Joy flows in the night as well as the day. Joy flows all through persecution and opposition. It is an unceasing fountain bubbling up in the heart, a secret spring which the world cannot see and does not know anything about. The Lord gives his people Perpetual joy when they walk in obedience to him. I want all of us to have this perpetual joy, this unstoppable joy. I don't want us to just survive being a Christian. I want us to like abound in love more and more and more. Listen to these words uh, from the beginning of Philippians. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ, in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrances, in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayers with joy. Because, you, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affections of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer 
that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God what an awesome passage paul had a vision for the church in Philippi that maybe the church in Philippi didn't even have for themselves. Imagine this. Paul planted this church in 49 AD, and then he's writing this letter in a, in about 11 to 12 years later. He's writing this letter back. I would just imagine that this church in Philippi um, maybe encountered some circumstances that caused them to doubt that maybe caused them to have fear. And that doubt and fear was, re was replacing the joy that they once knew when Paul was with them. And Paul is saying, that joy, the joy of your salvation, the joy that you had when I was with you, I want you to have that joy again. Paul has a father's heart for the church in Philippi. He wants them to have everything that God would have for them. He wants them to abound in love, grow in knowledge, and grow in their, tr in, in their trust and dependence on Jesus Christ. And that's what I want for all of us, that that same abounding love would happen here, and not only abounding love, but that we would grow in our knowledge of God's word and in our discernment of what is right and what is wrong, and that God would replace our hearts with his heart. Paul has this fatherly affection. And my kids are grown up now. I've got an almost 20-year-old daughter and, and a 15-year-old son who can't wait to get his driver's license in, a year, in less than a year. And he is so excited about that. And I often um, don't really remember back. But yesterday, I was holding my great niece, a little newborn baby, and as I looked into her face, I was like, wow, all these memories kept flooding to my mind of our kids when they were little. You, you lose sight of that so quickly. And the reality, when you're holding a little one, my heart rate slowed down, my, I started having more peace, uh, more patience, more joy. And my wife took a picture. I was, I'm not going to show it because you don't need to see a big picture of me up there. Um, <laughs> but my wife took this picture and she said, look at your face. You have pure joy on your face. And it was because I was able to hold a brand new baby. And I was flooded with remembrances, with memories of my kids. And I want the best for my kids. All dads do, I believe. And Paul loves this church in Philippi, and he wants them to realize that God who began a good work in them is going to faithfully carry it out. I'm sure in this span of about 10, 11, 12 years, these doubts welled up in their spirits, and they said, man, you know, God saved me, but I don't know. I'm not seeing a lot of growth. I'm not seeing a lot of fruit. In fact, I'm seeing struggle within our church. I'm seeing evidence against God being faithful. And Paul is reminding them in this prayer that God is faithful. And I want to just walk through a few things that this passage tells us about who God is and what God is doing. The very first thing that it talks about is that God is our Father. Just like Paul has a fatherly affection for this church in Philippi, Paul is reminding this church that God is is our father now many of us in this room we're going to be celebrating father's day in a few weeks um, many us many of us in this room might not have the best relationships with our father and so this may be a difficult concept to have um, god who is our loving father who holds nothing back who wants the best for us so paul indicates in this prayer in the beginning of this letter first and foremost that god is our father now, a father is one who protects, who provides, who
who meets the needs of his kids. And a lot of times, as men particularly, we feel like, you know what, I need to pre- be the protector of my family and I need to be pr- the provider. Paul is reminding all of us that in the end, God is our protector and God is our provider. God is the one that does that. Now, he will do that through us. It's not us doing that for God. It's God doing his work through us. Secondly, it talks about God or Jesus um, being our Lord. He is Lord over all. The book of Colossians talks about the supremacy of Christ in such a powerful way. And it talks about the reality that Jesus is not only Lord over those um, he, he is over those of us that surrender to him. He is Lord over all because he has full authority, rule and reign forevermore. It goes on to say that uh, God began a good work in you. So think back in your own life and reminisce a bit and think about the reality that God began a good work in you Many of you don't know my testimony, but I came to know Christ as a little five-year-old boy sitting in a Sunday school class uh, in Nina, Wisconsin. I passed the building on my way up here this morning, and I, I almost took a picture, but you shouldn't drive and take pictures. So, um, so Calvary Bible Church is where I went to church uh, starting at two weeks old, and When I was five years old, I had this Sunday school teacher who loved little guys. And he just said, I want these little guys to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Um, He wasn't the smartest man on the planet Earth. He also wasn't the dumbest man on the planet Earth. But he, he knew one thing, and he knew one thing well. He knew that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save. And so... He actually, for an entire school year, when I was in first grade, or kindergarten, he actually um, would round us little guys up at church, and we had the same Sunday school lesson every week. <laughs> like I said, he wasn't a brilliant man, um, but he knew that the gospel of Jesus has the power to save those of us that are sinners. And so... As you guys know, I'm kind of slow, so it took me about seven or eight weeks uh, to realize, to kind of hear the same message over and over and over again. Finally, on the seventh or eighth week, I prayed to receive Christ. And I can look back and say, you know what? When I remember that, it brings me great joy to know that a man cared enough about me to pray for me and then teach me the same exact Sunday school lesson week after week after week after week until I understood what the gospel was all about. And I am so very thankful for that. The reality, though, for each and every one of us, God has begun a work in each one of us. God began a work for many of you many years ago, and he is continuing his work because he is a faithful God. For some of you, maybe today will be the day of your salvation. Maybe today will mark a special time where God intervened in your life. Maybe you're sitting here and you're going, I don't even know why I'm at church. I don't know how that happened. Years ago, I was was a part of a church that met in a movie theater. And a man showed up at the door to our movie theater where we met. And uh, he knocked on the window, and I let him in because we hadn't unlocked the door yet for church. And he's like, what are you guys doing in here so early in the morning on a Sunday? There's no movies. said, we're setting up for a church. He said, what time do you guys do that deal? And I said, well, church is at 10. He said, oh, I'm going to bring my whole family back. He brought his whole family back. And... The, the reason he actually stopped is that he actually had to go to the bathroom. Um, and so he stopped because he saw that the light was on and he had to go to the bathroom. The Lord used his bladder <laughs> as an impetus to start a discussion about things of God. He invited his whole family back later and over the next uh, year... Him, his wife, and his two kids came to know Christ, um, all because of his bladder. 
And so God uh, may have you here this morning. You may be going, I don't even know what these songs are that we're singing. Um, I don't know why the words are up on the screen. And I don't know what this Jesus is all about. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And we want you to know the love of Jesus, the love that God has for you. The reality, though, goes on that even though God began a good work in us, um, he is faithful to complete the work that he began. I love how Paul puts this so clearly. Paul is not saying, you know what, look at me. I am so awesome. I started the church in Philippi, and now you know I'm a prisoner because of the gospel. Look at how awesome I am. Um, now I'm writing you this letter as you know, giving you instruction, look at me. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, God began the work in you. God is going to carry it to completion because God is faithful. So I can say the same thing to you guys, that God who began a good work in you is faithful to complete the work he began. Now, is it all going to be easy and pretty? I can't guarantee that. In fact, I can guarantee quite the opposite. God will meet you right where, right where your sin um, is evident. And, and he'll reveal your sin to you because he loves you and he wants you to confess your sin so that when you confess your sin, he is faithful and just and he'll forgive you of your sin because you can't forgive yourself of your own sin. If we could, Christ died for nothing and he died that we might have life. Uh, God is also Paul's witness to Paul's heart for the church in Philippi. God, Paul realizes that God is witnessing what Paul is going through in prison as his heart yearns and aches for this church in Philippi to be abounding in love and growing in knowledge and growing in discernment. That's what he wants and Paul realizes, you know, no one else is around here with me. I'm in prison, um, but God is my witness, is what Paul says. So God is Paul's witness. Uh, but not only that, through Christ, this vision of abounding in love and this vision of growing in knowledge and discernment can be lived out. We can't muster up enough strength to make that happen on our own, but God can and does cause that to happen in us. So now we look at uh, what does this passage tell us about who we are and what we are to do. First of all, the, Paul begins this letter by saying, Paul and Timothy, assert, we're servants. So Paul is right off the bat taking a position of humility, saying, you know what, we're here to serve you. We're here, we're, I'm writing this letter as a way to serve you. I'm a servant, and I love how he refers to the church in Philippi as saints. It would be quite easy for him to do quite the opposite, saying, I'm the saint, and you are my servants. Go get the work done at the church. And he's saying, you know what? No, I'm here to serve you. I'm, I want to humble myself. I want to serve you so that you see yourself as saints, as dearly loved children of the Most High God, as you go out and you make an impact in Philippi. Paul also uh, wishes grace and peace to the church. He does this at the beginning of all of his letters or most of his letters where he's, he's wishing grace and peace. Grace and peace. The reality is we all need more grace than we will ever understand. <laughs> if you look at our lives, we need the grace of God on a daily basis. And most of us long to have peace. I know some people, they spend all kinds of money um, seeking peace. And the reality is we can just realize God's peace for us. And Paul is wishing this grace and peace upon the church at Philippi and also for us as well, that we would have God's grace would be flowing in and through our lives and God's peace in the midst of our storms that we would have God's peace. Paul also remembers the church with thankfulness. He is so very thankful. In his memories of the church, he is going, I am so thankful that I was able to partner 
for the sake of the gospel with you, that I was a partaker of the grace of God with you. And I want that to continue even in my absence. Um, it's a joy for Paul to pray. I know sometimes when we think of prayer, we think, wow, um, it's not a joy. But prayer should be a profound joy. When we remember people that we have served in the past or are currently serving, when they come to our memory, we should just continually be praying and say, wow, thank you, God, for giving me this opportunity to lift this person before you. It brings me great joy. Paul was a doer. He always loved to plant churches. He planted 14 churches we know of, and he loved to go do and do and do and do. And now he's locked up. So now his doing has turned to writing and praying, writing and praying, writing and praying. And he said, this fills my heart. This gives me great joy to be able to pray for you and to write to you. Uh, Paul also is thankful uh, for their partnership in the gospel. He has seen evidence of the church in Philippi, and he has heard reports through Epaphroditus that this church is continuing to, to spread the gospel into their city. And that brings Paul a great joy. Paul also has a father's heart for this church in Philippi. And this next phrase that Paul is thankful that they are partakers of grace with him. I love the reality that they're partakers. When, when I was in middle school, I have an older sister. She's four years older than me. And her friends, all these high school girls would come over to have a sleepover at our house. And they'd make this stuff called monkey bread. Um, I don't even know what it is. It has nothing to do with monkeys, I assure you. Um, but it's sticky, ooey, gooey stuff. And it's just like this clump of stuff. And everyone would be partakers of it. They'd all be pulling from the same blob of monkey bread. And Paul is saying, you know what? We're all partakers of the grace of God which indicates a few things. First of all, Paul understood he still needed the grace of God. He is a partaker. But he's saying, you know what? It is so awesome because you're partakers too. And we're partakers of the same grace. And we desperately need this grace. We should partake, be partakers every day of this grace of God. And I'm thankful that we are able to share the grace of God together, that we are able to extend it there are people in your life that desperately need the grace of God. Whoever the person that most annoys you is, um, that's the person that needs the grace of God. If you're going, I, I want to run the other way, you know what? Before you run the other way, pause and say, wow, here is an opportunity to extend grace. Instead of running... Use that opportunity to say, God, fill me with your grace and your peace that I might be your vessel, your ambassador to extend that same grace and peace that you extended to me while I was, a yet, while I was yet a sinner. You died for me. You gave your life for me. Help me give my life so that others may taste of your grace. And Paul uh, like I said, he has, he has a twofold vision for this church in Philippi. I think he wants more for the church than the people in Philippi want for their own church. He's saying, I want you to abound more and more in love, and I want you to increase in knowledge and discernment. I want that to happen in, in an exponentially growing kind of way. That you guys, when people would look at the church of Philippi, they'd go, wow, that group is so loving. That group is known as the loving people in our city. And not only that, they're growing day by day in knowledge of God's word as well as discernment of how to use that. I know some people that know God's word so well, but they don't have the discernment in how to use it. They use it to lord their authority over people and they say, you know what, I know the right way to live as a righteous Christian. Let me tell you, tell you how wrong you are and um, how right I am. We don't tend to want to be around those types of people. 
uh, because we see them as judgmental, judgmental and hypocritical and, and self-righteous and all these negative things. But Paul is saying, I want you to abound more and more in love and I want you to grow in knowledge and all discernment. This word all, in fact, it shows up seven times in these 11 verses, this absolute word all. I hate absolute words, and, and, and especially when they're used against me. Like, you're always late. Like, no, there was that one time I was on time. I'm not always late, or you never, you can fill in the blank. Um, absolute words can be used to damage, but Paul is saying all repeatedly in this as a way to use strong and powerful language to indicate his passion for the church in Philippi and God's passion for his church. And this all, bottom line, this all happens through Christ and for the glory and praise of God. The church cannot be the church apart from Christ. If we try to do this on our own energy and our own effort, we're just going to mess the thing up. But if we trust that God is going to do his faithful work through us, it's not us working for God to make the church all it can be. It's God doing his work through us. That's kind of humbling because it's not about us. It's through Christ that we are allowed to be the church that he has called us to be. And it is for the glory of God. Through Christ, for the glory of God. Think about that. It's not about us either way. It's not because of our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own knowledge about Scripture and how we can tell other people how right we are and wrong they are. It is saying, you know what? Through Christ, we can become all that God has created us to be. And why we are created to be all that we can be, we can be is to glorify God and praise God. Did you know that this church is not about us? It's, it's His church doesn't belong to any one of us. We are his church, transformed by his gospel, on his mission for his glory. It's not about us. Imagine for a moment that you have millions of dollars in the bank. Now imagine that you never spend a dime of it and live in poverty. Are you rich? Yes. But if you don't enjoy your riches then in your practical experience, it's as if you have nothing. As believers, we've received Christ. But God's intention isn't just for us to have Christ, it's for us to enjoy Him to the uttermost. Many of us find that the joy we experience when we first receive Christ can fade away. But the Bible shows us how we can maintain the joy of our salvation. First, we can confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As soon as we confess our sins, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. By this, our fellowship with Christ, the source of our joy, is restored. Second, we can feed on God's Word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them. And your word became to me the gladness and joy of my heart. It's hard to be joyful when we're hungry. But when we pray over God's word to eat it as spiritual food, it nourishes, satisfies, and makes us glad. Third, we can pray. John 16, 24 says, Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be made full. When we pour out our heart to the Lord in prayer, the things that weigh us down are lifted, and we sense a deep joy and refreshment. Finally, we can fellowship with others who love the Lord. 1 John 1, 3-4 says, That you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write that our joy may be made full. The greatest enjoyment for a Christian is to be with others who love and enjoy Christ. Our salvation is like a rock that can never be shaken. But the joy of our salvation is like a delicate flower that needs to be cultivated every day. 
by practicing to confess our sins, feed on God's word, pray to the Lord, and fellowship with other Christians, we'll enjoy Christ and live a joyful Christian life. I just want you to think about that. God began a good work in you, and he is going to carry it out to completion because he is faithful. But our part is to come to God and the realities of um, the realities of first of all confessing, but then feeding on His Word and praying and fellowshipping in small groups um, are desperately needed to cultivate uh, that. I love how it, it, it said, "Okay, our foundation, our, our salvation is like a rock, but the joy of." of living in Christ is like a, a delicate flower that needs to be tended to. And the way we tend that is through confession and feeding on God's word and prayer and fellowship. Uh, it, when we confess, God is faithful. And he'll forgive us of our sins. And he does the cleansing work. We cannot clean ourselves up. We were not created to clean ourselves up. God is the one that does that. And he replaces our burdens and our struggles and our fears and our, our anxiety with his joy. And I just want to end uh, by reading a brief quote. Uh, this is a book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ from John Piper. I um, highly recommend this book, but it says uh, in one paragraph in here, it says, for those who have tasted the joy of Jesus, surely nothing is more compelling than the all-surpassing hope of hearing his final words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter, enter, into joy, enter into the joy of your master. The city of God is a city of joy. And that joy is indescribable joy of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about that. Our joy is inextricably tied to the person and work of Jesus Christ. We cannot have joy apart from Jesus. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the powerful words of Paul that reveals to each and every one of us that you have begun a gospel work in our lives to save us, but Lord, you don't stop there. You are faithful to complete the work that you have begun in us day after day after day. Lord, I pray that we would look more and more like Jesus, not because of what we do, but because of what you're doing in us. Lord, help us to be people that are quick to confess, quick to forgive, and Lord, that we would be people that would feed on your word. Lord, that we would hunger for your word. Lord, place that hunger in us. Cause us to not only feed on your word, but Lord, to pray and to fellowship with those that you've put us in relationship with. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, I pray right now that it would continue its transforming work. Lord, that you who have begun a good work in us would carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray all of this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.